is still plus politics and we have been talking about Nigeria's debt profile. Now, um, let me come back to you, um, Gospel. Let's talk about state budgets. Now, state governors um, have continuously had humongous budgets. Sometimes um, some of these budgets are christened with the most ridiculous names. Um, take, for example, the government of Cross River. They have the most interesting names for their budget. And for a state like Cross River, whose mainstay is uh, supposedly agriculture, but then so far, um, the, 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 the profits, or rather the return on the investment in agriculture has not been so great, being that the state is also somewhat, in quotes, a civil service state. Um, the, the amount of money that these budgets are pegged at, sometimes are ridiculous. And just like um, Alester said, who's probing? Who's asking the questions? Again, um, we have other things, other subheads that monies go to, and these monies are not accounted for. For example, we have security votes. Um, who's to say how much is given, how much is expended on security, etc., etc. Uh, now that we are saying we want a better Nigeria, we want good governance, should these conversations not be on the table? Yes, I agree that this conversation should be on the table, and it's quite worrisome. Um, in my own opinion, I do not. A lot of states in Nigeria um, currently not commercially viable. I mean, they're not, not just commercially viable. Um, as, uh, and also, if you, if you just suppose that with the fact that there is a huge public leadership deficit in Nigeria, that's to tell you that many state governors do not have the vision to transform their states into solid economic hubs. Um, most states have a lot of raw materials, natural resources right there, you know, within um, that context. But then again, it requires a visionary leadership to take that and transform that as you know solid exchange block, you know, to drive um, growth and development in the state and even regional competitiveness. But then that ties heavily on public leadership and the vision of these states. Um, so we've not seen that to a very large extent. And on the other hand of things, um, there are no strategic civil service groups or any form of um, um, citizen agenda setting that is that is a lot towards um, accountability. I want to say accountability. We don't mean we don't mean shouting on Twitter or trying to um, tag somebody and you making some hell of noise. We're talking about some intelligent advocacy. You know how much of evidence-based efforts are being plugged into measuring government efforts. You know if a particular gov governor comes and says that he spent X Y Z billions of naira trillions in the past X Y Z years in agriculture, for instance. Our civil service, sorry, our civil pressure groups or even uh, NGOs or social enterprises, mm -hmm. you know, going to measure to tell us, oh, this is not true, this is actually how much was invested, this is actually where the money was invested, this is why we have this gap, this is why we not yet, this particular effort has not yielded so much impact and all that. So, until we have a very comprehensive, uh, institutional, intelligent, advocacy focused um, citizenry, you know, and its and it, um, pressure groups as it were, we may not be truly be able to hold government accountable. Meaningfully, what well, there's a public leadership deficit in Nigeria. And the trend that has been amplified, amplified for a long time. You have about 36 states and almost 50 to 60 percent. I mean, only Lagos and River states contribute 65 percent of VAT share to the central government. That's so ridiculous when you have about 36 states. So it's it's worrisome. And because you don't have development of the form of growth or productivity in these states. It, 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 it affects everything, including debt, you know, in terms of debt profiling, in terms of, terms of ability to repay back these debts. Let's not forget that during COVID and all of those period, the central bank had to step in to bail out some states and all of that. And that culture is going to continue because it's primarily hinged on the root causal challenge of a public leadership deficit in our system. Mm. Just, just to, I mean, play some role, play the role of a devil's advocate on this issue. We have some civil society groups. The likes of Serap have continuously questioned government on monies that are not necessarily well spent or monies that have yeah. disappeared. We must give it to the likes of Serap. There's also follow the money with. Um, code we also have i think budgets and some other civil society groups that but then i know that what you're talking about concerted efforts and more strategic plans towards you know mm -hmm. checking governance uh, that's very good uh, but let's talk about the issue of states still going cap in hand to the federal government every single time to get monies to run 
you know, their own, uh, you know, uh, there was a time that we brought the issue of restructuring and it seemed to have been a campaign tool, but where is it now? It's, it's obviously in the, on the back burner. Um, should we still be sustaining that conversation? Because if you're saying that many states are not even commercially viable, um, uh, why are we still talking about having across the board pay for let's say civil servants, ASU is on strike. We know so many issues. Take, for example, in Abia State, the government is still owing resident doctors for one year. They've been on strike for a year. And this is also as a result of the fact that some of these states are unable to pay these monies across the board. Shouldn't we be changing yeah. the, the, the tide of this conversation? Yeah, I mean, when we say states are not economically viable, it doesn't mean that they don't have economic potential. They do have economic potential, but that potential has not been transformed to some form of um, competitive block, you know, to do business, to thrive, to scale productivity and prosperity at large. Um, yes, um, a, a lot more can be done, you know, like as, as you rightly mentioned, a lot more can be done. Many states are still very dependent on the central government for these things. And then again, the restructuring conversations on the table. Should that conversation continue? Yes. Yes, because that's the only way around to which many questions around social inclusion, around prosperity, shared prosperity and sustainability will thrive. Anything, you know, anything um, other than that is just a waste of time of conversation in the real sense because the current state of extractive institutions, which is counter the restructuring efforts, are not be geared towards wastage, you know. Extractive institutional economics would always fund waste in a bid to sort of um, um, secure, I mean, monies and control and power, you know, towards a critical minority. And that's what's happening right now. In fact, the idea of funding or, or, or centralizing VAT at the, at, at, the, at the federal level is also some form of, I mean, it still patterns after extractive institutional inter institutions, all right? So until we begin to think about restructuring, constitutional reviews and all of these things, we may not be able to really, really put responsibility in the hands of state government. And until responsibility gets into the hands of state government, in many cases, we may not be able to hold them accountable or, or, or channel the right questions around regional competitiveness or state competitiveness to a very large extent. I believe that 36 states in one, in, in the other side of things, holds huge economic power for us to do more um, for ourselves as a state and as, as, as a nation. But again, that thrives heavily on public leadership. And I think um, a lot more numbers of NGOs need to arise, you know, to tackle more strategic blocks of this conversation. You need a lot of NGOs in security, you need a lot of NGOs in, in economic policy, a lot of NGOs in child care, and all of these things. We, we want to scratch the surface at all. So we're technically joking, you know, with the current state of things. And until these things fundamentally change at the structural level with the restructuring conversation, I don't think we're going to take off at all. Alesta, um, how do we make sure that the issue of restructuring the conversation does not become very politicized? Because, like I said, it, it seems like the issue of restructuring comes up when we're trying to run for elections, and then it's like a slogan of sorts or something that we use to try to get the people to come out and vote. And right after that, it's shelved. Um, again, if we do really get to the the meat of restructuring, will this one way or the other shed the weight of unnecessary people running for offices, especially when they know that they do not have what it takes to run that state? Well, um, I'm not a proponent of restructuring uh, noise. Uh, just like you said, restructuring, if you ask 10 people talking about restructuring, they will tell you 10 different things that restructuring means to them. So until I, I get a clear understanding of what aspect of resource we're talking about what people always talk is resource control and that lies heavily or maybe states within the south south who thinks that uh, the oil resources that they think is the major of Nigerian economy should be in their control when you talk about restructuring that's what everyone talks about but of course even within the south south that talks about restructuring uh, you discover that a few other states who are not and that with the resources will also, also have a different perspective of what restructuring means so I am not caught up in that trap, but I will talk, I will really address uh, or let to what my colleague has just said about states. States rule as emperors in this country. I mean, the states, the state governments are more powerful than the president of this country within their domain, their, I mean, their domain. So they run, on, I mean, on a free will with, with respect to accountability, 
with respect to public uh, morality, with respect to governance and governance structure. We discover that state governors are, like I call emperors, the main uh, checks and balances within the state, which is the legislature and the judiciary, how many states have effective legislature? Now, if you don't have an effective legislature, how can civil society thrive? Because the, the, the legislature is the biggest civil society check on the executive. And if you discover that, what happens at the federal level? You, it doesn't happen at the state level. Sometimes we focus our attention, and that's also why you, you would disagree with me, I'm always calling the state, the, the media, to account for some of these lapses because they will all ever focus on what happens with the federal government and leave the states. And the states are the ones that run, in, uh, uh, I mean, run the show. You know, I, I, I mean, per se, they run the show, the domestic show. But we are blaming the federal government for the price of garlic, the price of tomato, the price of yam. We blame the, the federal government. We know that the states are the ones that run it. Now, the state has no effective judiciary. The chief judge of the state is in the, is in the pocket of the, of, the, of, of the governor. A governor can wake up and shut down courts in Nigeria. It has happened severally. The governor can wake up and remove a, 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 a chief judge, and nothing will happen. The governor can wake up and shut House of Assembly. Everybody has to contest election to be, to be a member of the House of Assembly. Is the governor crony. And that is why the governors make sure that they win all the seats in the House of Assembly. I'm not even talking about local government, which is supposed to be a strong arm of the entire federation for the discussion. That one no longer exists because the governors now run the local government as they did fit. So at the point where the governors are not accountable and they are not, Apart from maybe a few states, maybe states like Lagos, that people still have an eye because of the cosmopolitan nature, that people still have an eye and can still, which other states can boast of an effect deliberation? A governor will submit a budget to the state assembly on Monday, and by Wednesday the budget is passed and it signs, and he implements the budget. He doesn't go back to tell them how it is implemented, so long as everybody says. And then, within the states, the opinion molders. The opinion and critical opinion, let's even leave the civil society now. I'm talking about the opinion molders. Where are they? They are all in the pockets of the governors. So long as you have been settled, so long as you are, you are fair share of the booty is being given, you keep quiet. And so it is called that in the state, people, especially down south, people are critical, are everybody wanting to become, to, to be the free friend, to be close to the state government. Look, I visited the local government, my local government the other day. And I find people milling every Tom Dick and milling around the chairman's office. And when I look at these people, and I ask some few questions, they didn't come for any reasonable proposal, they didn't have anything to any proposal on what we better meet anybody, they are only looking for handouts. And of course, what the local government chairman will do, he will just give handouts, and people will just smile, clap on him, and say, This is a good a good man, this is a good woman. And so the citizenry, the court of citizenry is suspect. So when the court of citizenry is suspect, and not because they are poor, and I don't buy this poverty, poverty, poverty analysis. It is poverty. Look, if you are poor, it is a mental, it is a mental state that you are poor. So I'm not buying this poverty. The, 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 the poor cannot feed. And I don't buy that narrative. Okay. I, I do out of I, I was not. Hold on, hold on. I didn't come from a rich home. I mean, I know what I went through. I sold my wood. In, in the street of Potak, I stole Pap Akamokogi. It is not Potakot for me to get to where I am today. So poverty is not a strange phenomenon. But you see, dignity. Dignity is all. Hard work is all. These days, people no longer, no, people no, no, no longer want to work. Okay. They want free peace. They want handouts. And so they use the cloak of, oh, the poor cannot feed. So okay. you sell your bad right. And then the government all right. I, riot. I, I want to come and back. Then, I want to come back to. Session, all right, with all understand. kinds of policies and all kinds I don't of want us to, Yeah, I don't want us to veer off. I want to come back to my question because I think you did not like the, the idea of restructuring. But if we all stuck to the economic viability of states, every single state in this country has one mineral resources or the other. If we all decide that we look within and see how viable we are, I asked a simple question. Will that reduce the number of funny people running for office? No, it will not. As a matter of fact, if there is critical thinking, like you said, if there is critical thinking about exploration, about production in each state, not even, not, not even leave mineral. California does not have mineral resources. 
California is not Texas. California is not uh, 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 what do you call it? It's not um, one of the states in the in the U.S. that has mineral resources that have oil. But California is a tech-based state, and is the I mean I, I mean I wouldn't say the few, but it is one of the top ten largest economy of the world. Now I remember when uh, 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 Dr. Bonner Honor was running for uh, uh, governor of all Asia states. He talked about tech hub because this is a man I met in Vassar Potakos. He's a professor, he's a son, uh, a, a professor of engineering. And he talked about tech hub in Abia when he was running for, gov uh, for office in 1991. I remember vividly because he taught me one of my DGS calls and taught, it was about technology. These are people that has it. But when he became governor of Abia, how did he translate it? Although his time was short, he spent just 22 months as governor of Abia. How did he translate it? Now, today, we would not want to hear the truth about Lagos. Do we see how Lagos is progressing? Do we see how Bar Beach was tamed? I'm not campaigning. But you see, these are critical thinking of what people can go to do in government and sustain over a period of time. Now, states like states like Ekiti, um, uh, states like Ekiti, with all the intellectual where it's the intellectual warehouse of Nigeria in terms of the number of intellectual professors that are developed in that state. Sincerely speaking, that state has no business with poverty, but that's one of the poorest states. That's one of the states with the least IGRO in, the, in, 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 in fact, in the country. Okay. States like Oshun, I'm coming, states like Oshun, that should be, that should be sitting pretty heavy on, 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 on agricultural production and sub, other sub smaller minerals. Now, the, the argument would be the federal government is holding to that. But nothing stops you from seeking license from the federal government to invest and exploit mineral resources. Nothing stops you from doing that. So there are excuses for failure. But these excuses, the press and we, the analysts, help to, to reinforce them. But as far as I'm okay. concerned, these are late excuses that make people to see free money okay. in what comes from the federal account and VAT, and they just and there's no accountability. No measurement criteria for the state. All right, thank you, Alasta. Willy nilly, and then they run, and then they run Thank you, Alasta. Thank you, thank you. Um, Gospel, let me come back to you as we round up this conversation. Three point six five billion dollars of batch loot was recovered by our federal government in twenty four years. Now, most of those payments came under the Buhari administration, and we've seen more and more of these monies come in. Um, the question many people have asked is. Where did these monies go? At some point, the federal government said they were going to use some of it to complete the, um, I think, Kaduna um, Highway, if I'm not mistaken, and, and some other you know, um, infrastructural projects. Um, but then we keep continuously borrowing to fund our budgets. So where does the money go? And finally, are you sure that we will ever be able to have this conversation about states looking within and um, you know, becoming economically viable, being that many countries in the world have moved beyond fossil fuel. Now we're talking green energy, we're talking alternative sources of energy, we're seeing electric cars, especially in the UK and in Europe. Um, and Nigeria is still here grappling, we're, we're still dealing, for example, in River State with the um, illegal refineries that are causing some health hazards, gas flaring, even though there's been a law against it, the federal government and these international oil companies still doing some kickbacks and cutting deals here and there. Will we ever be able to go beyond this and have realistic conversations that will help us play catch up with the rest of the world? Thank you very much, Marianne. Um, one of the biggest worries of our time, you know, especially for developing economies, not just in Nigerian phenomenon only, is the fact that extractive institutions are really thriving hard. And that means that, so, so take, for, take for instance, now outside this abacha loot conversation, um, you want to also ask yourself, when subsidy was, you know, taken out and all of those things were moderated in, in Jonathan's era and Shopee was created, you know, how many persons really benefited from that program, you know, there are so many questions around how public finances are being spent and people do not know exactly where these monies are spent and um, who to hold accountable, you know, what projects, what policy drives, what, 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 sorry, what policy initiatives, you know, where, which sectors, you know, are, are beneficiaries of these monies and all that. So I think that the core is not just the fact that probably a, a, a government institution doesn't want to 
spend those monies or be open about it. I just think it's a cultural thing to believe that you know you owe nobody an explanation around how this money should be should be spent or where they're being spent. Let's not forget that we're seeing that again replay in one way or the other ahead of these elections. You know, institutions or people who believe that they do not have to, to attend a presidential or a gubernatorial debate, you know, you know, people like that should not even have any um, business to do with public office in the first place because that's, that's a sign to show that they would not be accountable to the people. So these are big, they bother heavily on the accountability questions, on the transparency questions, on the extractive decision questions of our time. Them also, that same narrative and ideology is what has also hampered Nigeria from moving forward into the green energy or the climate and, you know, sustainability conversation of our time. You know, the, a lot of people, if you look at the construct of the Nigerian oil and gas, it is designed to continue that way. Meaning that one of the major reasons why power has not been fixed today in Nigeria is because a lot of people are making, some, some, some minority are making a, a lot of money from, from the um, oil and gas block, you know, so I'm trying to, so once Nigerians have access to power, it means that people will buy less fuel, less fuel, you know, uh, businesses will buy less diesel and the likes, and it, oil marketers will be out of business, mm. all right, so the extractive institution or the economics of a few have designed it in such a way that you don't want to be accountable to anybody, at the same time, you also want to hijack economic resources so that it's not made available to a critical mass. You know, who need that opportunity to further prosper? I don't even know what I'm trying to say. So, yeah. until these legs of extractive decisions are swept off the table, you know, okay. via a much more forward thinking, disruptive leadership, All you right. know, you know, much more inclusive focus leadership, I don't think that there'll All be right. any progress going forward uh, within this conversation. All right, I want to say thank you um, for being part of the conversation, gentlemen. Um, Dr. Muda Yusuf is uh, the Director Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise, and also Alester Wilcox is a Chartered Accountant. He is uh, the head of uh, ICANN here in Lagos, and Gospel Obele is the Chief Economist of Streetonomics Limited. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Very interesting conversation, and I don't think we should stop having these kinds of conversations. Thank you for Thank having you for me. Having all right. Well, that's it on Plus Politics tonight. We leave you with the highlights of this week's conversations in case you missed it from Monday up until Thursday. I am Mary Anacon. Don't forget, go get your PVC because that's your passport to a new Nigeria. And don't forget, you can go to your ward, the ward that is closest to you, where you registered, and pick up your PVC. You do not have to go to the local government's headquarters until January 15. Have a good night. We want to win the election. No party wants to do away with their governors or such kind of high caliber, uh, you know, uh, leaders. So we want to win the election. But you see, when you when when you go to when you interrogate what is behind this, I think there is much more that uh, that that behind why they are recalcitrant. The point is this: the G five, I believe led by Governor Wiki, who is also a family member, I will call him because PDP is family. I believe there's something behind it. It's a situation whereby we are trying to even move away from post safe way. And Nigeria as a country has not even been able to actualize itself in terms of really being able to maximize the post safe way that is found under its soil. Then it becomes a problem. Nigeria has not been able to refine product that can be used locally. Today when we talk about oil theft in the Niger Delta and some of these issues that are going on like corruption in this sector, there are ways that we can fight and win this war. But then, the followers and the leaders, they have a role to play. But more power is there in the hands of the leaders who need to summon the political will to be able to drive this problem. For example, we are talking about addressing crude oil thefts in the Niger Delta. We are talking about how to bring about the modular refinery that should be able to address this issue to minimize crude oil theft and environmental pollution, including suits that we suffer. Government is not giving it attention. What does it take for them to drive that process? We have also proposed this presidential artisanal Crude Oil Refining Development Initiative, which is a way of legalizing artisanal refining after modifying it to be more environmental friendly. Government is also taking steps, but nothing has been done so far to address it. We need to be able to address these issues in, in, uh, in a way that 
when the citizens suggest ways of addressing it, we have experts in the oil and gas industry. We put our heads together to see how we can address our problem. It is only when we can do this that we can look at a holistic and collective solution to the problem. But when we fail to address this problem because our leaders are also not being able to drive the process of addressing the problem, then I think we'll be having the issue that we are having at an abate, not subside. So we need to be able to see how we can work together, synergize, to address the problem that we have in the oil and gas sector. Corruption is one of the things that is driving this process. And we need to see how we can collectively fight all these issues that we have so that we can address the issues in the oil and gas sector, right. move the country from fossil fuel to clean and renewable energy and agriculture for us to have a better nation and better environment. They are from one, one, one section of the country that does not even feel the pain that we are feeling here. All of them have refineries in neighboring countries. They are the people bringing in these vessels to steal crude oil to these refineries, refine the crude, and sell it at cultural prices to Nigeria. They, 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 they own the refineries around. So they will never allow the refineries in Nigeria to work. They will not allow the people to have electricity because they are the people importing generators into this country. And the people have just become their market. Hmm. They want to see every person dead. And, they are, and, and, and it is so sad that you know, they continue to amass wealth, gather this money, money that they will not even spend. They continue to steal and stockpile money. Some are buried in places they don't even know again. So you are dealing with daylight robbers okay. who know exactly what they are doing. Hmm. They are not, they, they are thieves. They know what they are doing. Okay. Not that they don't know that the refinery will not be working. No, they don't allow those people with their pensionaries so that, you know, uh, peanut like, like, I'll give you my shirt. You have my shirt now, and all the bottle. You give me one bottle. What they are giving to those workers is not one bottle. And they take the whole shirt.